Hey, good day, everyone. My name's Tom Quinn. I'm gonna try something a bit fun tonight. It's a cold winter's night in Melbourne and uh, we're in lockdown, so there's not much else to do. And I've been spending the last couple of months uh, evaluating various microbiome papers that have made use of machine learning and finding that an overwhelming majority of them, uh, the actual number being about 88%, do not properly use test sets. They either don't use a test set at all, or they leak data from the test set into the training, most commonly because they perform feature selection before separating out the test data from the training data. So this paper just passed on to my radar, and um, it, it's really interesting because it's the kinds of papers that I've been evaluating microbiome, although they're using metabolomics here. And I thought it might be fun to just do like a really quick evaluation of uh, this paper and particularly that machine learning side of things uh, to see if it's any good. Um, the reason it caught my eye is because I'm really into biomarker stuff. And of course this is a COVID thing, right? So it's, it's very topical as I'm sitting here in lockdown. And I did a quick screening of the abstract and ooh, look at this, AUCs of 94.7. So what is it that they're actually predicting? Um, non-COVID controls from PCR positive, not hospitalized, and another panel predicting uh, not hospitalized from hospitalized. So they're claiming essentially that this metabolomic profile can almost perfectly separate people with COVID and without COVID. So that's a pretty major claim. Like an AUC 94% is nothing to, nothing to laugh about. And an AUC 97.5% is hugely accurate, right? So that might be true. It might be true that, you know, COVID does such a massive uh, change into the body that you can, you can separate this out pretty quickly. I guess the thing, though, I, uh, that I think concerns me with when I see these kinds of numbers is particularly in the context of this right here. Patients were classified into four groups with about 40 samples each. So these are pretty bold claims for, I think, having a group of what is what? So two groups of 40 each, so 80 samples. So they're, they're claiming that they can build a classifier in 80 samples. That's 97% accurate at determining hospitalization for COVID. So that's pretty major. Um, so yeah, when I see something like that, I, get, I, I guess I get a little bit suspicious, a little bit skeptical. And then, um, yeah, I'm going to jump into the methods and we're going to have a, have a, quick look at what they've done in terms of their machine learning pipeline and see if it see if it passes the sniff test all right this is one of those papers i think they put methods at the end patient enrollment we'll assume they've done all that correctly that's not really my area to say metabolomics sample preparation all this quantification all right we're getting to statistical analysis here so let's see what they actually did Removing metabolites of missing values, that seems reasonable. Going to do some PCA, PL, SDA. Okay, that's not really the machine learning stuff. Um, okay, coefficient scores and lasso were used to identify the most discriminating metabolites for group comparisons. So I'm not sure if this is in the context of the machine learning yet, but um, the, what I'm thinking right now is that, well, if you're using lasso to select things, but they've not even mentioned the training test set split yet. So um, that's a little bit concerning to me, but maybe this lasso is being used for something else. So I haven't read the rest of the paper. This is my first time reading the methods also. So I don't, I, I don't know, this is what you get. It's, it's, this is pretty unfiltered. So metabolites with the highest score coefficient lasso scores were used to create these metabolite, metabolite panels for COVID status or outcomes using multivariate logistic regression. So they're saying the metabolites with the highest scores and lasso scores were used to create the panels. So, okay, so they are selecting the features that are useful based on the whole data set and then using them to fit the models. That's classic test set leakage. Um, additionally, models were adjusted for relevant potential confounders. Okay, that's good practice. Um, statistically significant variables remain, well, sure, whatever. Uh, logistic regression was then performed with the generalized log transformed and auto scaled data. Stepwise variable selection was also utilized for optimizing the model components. So this seems to be a second 
variable selection method that's being used on top of the initial reduction from the lasso scores, if I'm reading that correctly. So this is two types of feature selection, although they've not yet mentioned anything about separating out the test set. So presumably this is being done on the whole data set. Now they say, okay, furthermore, a K-fold cross-validation technique was used to ensure it's robust. Well, cross-validation only ensures that your model is robust if you're doing the feature selection as part of your cross-validation. If you're selecting your features and then feeding that into your cross-validation, then that isn't giving you a, an honest test set accuracy. Uh, what it's doing is it's telling you how well your model works on your training data, which is not representative of new unseen data, which is really what we want the model to work on, right? We don't want the model that works on the 80 patients in the study. We want a model that works on patients that we've never seen before. Okay, so in K-fold cross-validation kind of samples, but randomly into K groups, yep, yep, yep. Uh, results in predictive uh, biomarker predictive models that are both robust and optimal. So this is like the second time that the third time, I don't know, they keep saying <clears throat> that because they use cross validation, it's robust, but cross validation isn't a magic, uh, you know, a, a, a magic spell that all of a sudden your models are entirely reliable and all your AUCs are reliable. Um, because if you don't use cross validation correctly, i.e. you uh, select your features on the same data you use for the cross-validation, then your cross-validation is not going to be reliable. Uh, to determine the performance of each generated model, Aaron Brucey and Oppenheimer is calculated sensitivity, balance of sampling to use to generate RC code and curves. All right, this also seems pretty reasonable. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I'm not convinced that this was done correctly. Uh, looks like to me that they are doing feature selection before. Um, on the same data that they're testing it on, either it may be possibly doing it in two steps. Uh, it's a little bit unclear to me without, you know, say reading their, their code or, or going through the results of the paper a bit more. Um, another thing I wanna comment about what is another red flag when they're talking about uh, doing feature selection and cross-validation is that if you're doing feature selection as part of cross-validation as you're supposed to do, what you'll end up with is if you're doing K-fold cross-validation, you'll end up with K sets of selected features. There's no reason to assume that in every cross-validation round, you're going to select the exact same features. So you're going to have K sets of good features, which means when it comes to reporting your final panel, you, there should be some method describing how you're, how you're choosing or how you're aggregating information across those K sets. So let's say, you know, our final panel, you maybe say is that these are the three biomarkers that show up every single time. Or maybe you say that, you know, we include a biomarker if it shows up at least once in all of those K. Or maybe we say, okay, we use this nested cross-validation method to get, our, get a reliable AUC. Then we pool all of the data together, we train a single model, and that's the panel that we then report. So I would be looking for that kind of language to give me, um, uh, uh, to, to make me really trust that the AUCs that they're getting are coming from uh, a workflow that isn't leaking data from the test set into the training set. So um, in this kind of what is maybe five, 10 minutes, I've been reading this paper. Um, this is not passing the sniff test. So I guess the next thing I'm going to try to do is see if I can get a hold of their data. They seem to have some data availability on this repository here. And um, I'm going to see what kind of AUCs I get. <laughs>